1877. Council of 50. An organization intended to establish the political kingdom of God on the earth. An 1842 editorial in the church newspaper stated that the design of Jehovah was to take the reins of government into his own hand. On March 10th and 11th, 1844, Joseph Smith and several prominent elders met to discuss letters proposing a new gathering center for Latter-day Saint settlement in the Republic of Texas. On March 11th, they formally organized as a council, as William Clayton recounted, to establish a theocracy somewhere in Western North America. March 14, 1844, a revelation stated that the name of the council should be the kingdom of God and his laws, with the keys and power thereof, and judgment in the hands of his servants, Amen Christ. The members, however, generally referred to it as the kingdom of God, or the council of the kingdom, or more simply, as the kingdom or the council. Seniority and voting order in the council were based on age, though Joseph Smith presided over it as the standing chairman. On April 11, 1844, the council voted to receive Joseph Smith as their prophet, priest, and king. When the council reached 50 members, including three men who were not Latter-day Saints, Joseph Smith declared the council was full. Though the council sometimes had more or fewer than 50 members, it became known as the Council of Fifty. Joseph Smith taught that there was a distinction between the Church of God and the Kingdom of God, and that the laws of the Kingdom were not designed to affect our salvation hereafter. Rather, the council's purpose was to protect the saints in their religious rites and worship. On April 25, 1844, a Joseph Smith revelation stated that the Council itself was the constitution of the Kingdom of God and that its members were God's spokesmen in civil matters. In March and April 1844, the Council discussed principles of proper government, petitioned the U.S. government on behalf of the Saints, sought information on potential gathering places in the West, and planned missionary work among American Indians. In May 1844, most of the members left Nauvoo to campaign for Joseph Smith as U.S. President. So basically there's a difference between the Council of the Fifty and the uh, regular churches. It's not a religious group, it's a political group. After Joseph Smith's death, the Council of Fifty reassembled on February 4, 1845, and voted to sustain Brigham Young as standing chairman and Joseph Smith's successor. Under Young's leadership, the Council helped supervise the exodus of the Saints from Nauvoo and established civil government in Utah. It met infrequently thereafter until its final meetings in the 1880s. Brigham Young taught that Adam, the first man, was God the Father. These are peculiar thoughts and expressions. Brigham Young appears to have believed and taught Adam God, but he never developed a teaching into something that could be reconciled with LDS scripture and presented as official doctrine. Multiple problems in transmission. One, only source is the Journal of Discourses. Which is not an official Church publication. Two, it appears from reading the talk in its entirety, he is simply saying that Adam, our father, our father, and that he is the father of the human race, is now a de deified God. Which, we, which we all believe. See Doctrine and Covenants, section 132, verse 37. Three, he is also pointing out that others have as well that Adam is Michael and presides under the direction of Jesus Christ over the entire human race. 
See Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 15, and Doctrine and Covenants section 116, etc. 4. This is further clarified by the fact that in the same talk, he repeatedly refers to Elohim, or Heavenly Father, as a distinct being with distinct powers, authority, and role separate from Adam or Michael. Peculiar Thoughts and Expressions As life became more routine and economically stable by the mid-1850s, some of the general authorities came to believe that many church members and leaders had fallen spiritually asleep, becoming more enamored of materialism and the other trappings of Babylon than of building the kingdom. Brigham Young, Heber C. Kimball, and Jedediah Grant attributed the crop failures and grasshopper plagues of 1855 and 1856, in part at least, to a decline in faithfulness. Members seem less committed and enthusiastic. Not that prosperity itself was bad, but the saints seemed unable to maintain spirituality in the face of increasing prosperity. By early March 1856, Brigham Young's own observations together with reports from members of the Twelve led the church president to believe that the structural changes had not prompted a spiritual rejuvenation among the saints, and that even more intense measures would be required. Being a pragmatic man, he decided to take measures certain to elicit a response. <laughs> <laughs> Charging the people, presumably leaders and followers alike, with sleeping on the job and working wickedness. Young called upon the elders to put away their velvet lips and smooth things, and preach sermons like pitchforks, times downwards, that the people might wake up. Heber C. Kimball, Young's first counselor, followed the president's lead, but it was second counselor Jedediah M. Grant who really led the rally, sometimes attacking the Gentiles, but usually raining pitchforks on the Latter-day Saints. Drawing from passages in the Old Testament, Brigham Young made many statements teaching that some sins were so serious that the perpetrator's blood would have to be shed for the individual to receive forgiveness. The concept came to be known as blood atonement. Preachers in various American Christian traditions had a long history of utilizing intimidating rhetoric in their sermons. Very interesting. Young's listeners probably understood his rhetoric as hi hyperbole. 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 Three years later, Young stated, I have feelings, I frequently say, cut his infernal throat. I don't mean any such thing. Joseph Smith may have alluded to this idea in March 1843 during a city council discussion on punishment for criminals. He said he was supposed to hang he was opposed to hanging if a man kill another, shoot him or cut his throat, spilling his butt on the ground, and let the smoke thereof ascend up to God. And if I ever have the privilege of making a law on this point, I will have it so. So despite the fact that the notion of blood atonement was a rhetorical device and required the theoretical voluntary sacrifice of one's own life to repent for especially grievous sins, and that Young's references to blood atonement were hyper, hyper, hyperbole. Hyperbole. Hyper, hyperbole. Yeah. They may have prompted some overzealous members to put the doctrine into practice. In March 1857, William Parrish and several of his family and friends decided to leave the church and the community at Springville. They were murdered under suspicious circumstances, and although the perpetrators were never found, a number of commentators associated the deeds, the deeds with the doctrine of blood atonement. In addition, Brigham Young taught that in a complete theocracy, 
the Lord could require the voluntary shedding of a murderer's blood, presumably by capital punishment, as part of the process of atonement for such grievous sin. Since such a theocracy has has not been operative in modern times, the practical effect of the idea was its use as a rhetorical device to heighten the awareness of Latter-day Saints of the seriousness of murder and other major sins. This view is not a doctrine of the Church and has never been practiced by the Church at any time. The Josephite Brighamite Controversy When the saints made their exodus to the West, they stayed in Nauvoo. She seems, among other things, to have been worried about providing for her children, as well as protecting them from the violence which had claimed Joseph. Emma and Brigham also disagreed about which part of Joseph's estate were personal property and which belonged to the church. Illinois law, Illinois law at the time held that no church could hold more than 10 acres of property, and so much of the church's properties were held in Joseph's name. At the same time, much of the church's debt was held by Joseph as a private citizen. Thus, Emma was liable for Joseph, the church's debts, but had a less clear claim on the church's land that Joseph held as trustee and trust. Emma determined that the family's property not be swallowed up by the church claims, threatened that she would do the church all the injury that she could if the new trustee and trust were appointed without her approval. He was. <laughs> she warned that if the Twelve should trample on her, she would hire lawyers and work against them. She joined with William Law and William Marks to oppose Joseph while he was alive and work against the Twelve after his death in support of Sidney Rigdon's claims. Emma used a letter Joseph had written to her from the Iowa side of the river on 23 June as a guide in pursuing her claims with the Twelve who had possession of Joseph's papers, both business and private. <laughs> In that letter, Joseph told Emma, You may sell the Quincy property or any property that belongs to me for your support and children and mother. Emma pushed for the deed to the Quincy property, which was also known as the Cleveland Farm. Brigham later said he offered to trade the Bible containing Joseph's new translation for the farm. She got the deed, he said, but when Willard Richards asked her for the Bible, she told him she was not ready to give it up yet. Brigham Young probably never, never fully realized Emma's financial plight, the final outcome of Joseph's estate or its effect on her. Instead, he discoursed publicly on Emma's wealth, giving the impression that she had usurped most of it from the church. Emma, like those around her, she did not always react rationally, nor did she always make decisions in those trying years that others would have wished her to make. She alienated some of her friends, and they similarly alienated her. Brigham relayed the following incident from the pulpit in General Conference in 1866. Not six months before the death of Joseph, he called his wife Emma into a secret council, and there he told her the truth, and called upon her to deny, and called upon her to deny, to deny it if she could. He told her that the judgments of God would come upon her forthwith if she did not repent. He told her of the same, of the time she undertook to poison him, and he told her that she was a child of hell and literally the most wicked woman on this earth and that there was not one more wicked than she. He told, her, he told her where she got the poison and how she put it in a cup of coffee, said he. 
you got that poison from so-and-so, and I drank it, but you could not kill me. When it entered his stomach, he went to the door and threw it off. He spoke to her in that council in a very severe manner, and she never said one word in reply. I have witnesses of this scene all around who can testify that I am now telling the truth. Twice she undertook to kill him. That's the end of the General Conference <clears throat> address given in 1866. While it, is well, it has been well documented that Emma used her position as president of the Relief Society in Nauvoo to publicly and privately work against her husband's plural marriage initiative, one must call into question whether she tried to poison Joseph despite Joseph's accusations, which he relayed to Brigham Young. Either way, her collusion with William Law and William Marks, as well as her support for Sidney Rigdon, left her at odds with Brigham Young and the Twelve. When her sons came to Utah on a mission to reclaim the saints and bring them back to the Midwest, Brigham said publicly, Alexander Smith stated when here, that the Twelve robbed his mother of the last second shirt to her back. Now I want to tell this congregation what we did for his mother. Instead of the Twelve robbing her, she goes and takes these rings and possibly a portrait of Hiram from her sisters. She was not satisfied yet. She complained about her poor little fatherless children, and she kept up this wine until she got the farm she wanted. And besides these farms, she owned city property worth $50,000. We gave her all she asked for. Again, that was spoken in general comments. The animosity between Brigham Young and Emma had multiple grounds, personal, religious, and financial. Brigham, for all his strength, had little patience for anyone who would betray the prophet which he perceived Emid, which he perceived Emma was doing on multiple levels. Brigham also doubtless considered Emma dishonest and a liar because she continued to insist that her husband had never taught the doctrine of plural marriage. Which simply wasn't true. Some historians have concluded that Emma believed that Joseph had tried to rid himself in the church of plural marriage before his death. Sometime between Joseph's death and the adulthood of her sons, Emma began to ignore or deny plural marriage in her own life. But once Joseph III had firmly decided that his father had nothing to do with polygamy, his position trapped both himself and his mother. From his very first public address as the leader of the RLDS, the RLDS Church, it became clear that one of the main tenets Joseph Smith III would embrace and promote during his entire presidency was his antagonism towards the practice of plural marriage and desire to associate it from his family. To disassociate. To disassociate it from his family. In fact, for the next 30 years until the manifesto was issued by Wilford Woodruff, he repeatedly attempted to attach the origins of this practice to Brigham Young despite convincing evidence to the contrary that was continually presented to him by various colleagues within and without the RLDS Church. His campaign even included cooperative efforts with elected officials in Washington, D.C., who were crafting legislation that would eventually bring the Brighamite movement in Utah to its knees. Interestingly, RLDS historians Richard B. Howard and Roger D. Launus Lanius. Lanius have not only conceded that historical evidence confirms that Joseph Smith Jr. originated and was involved in the practice of plural marriage before he died, but they have also asserted that Joseph Smith III did not deal rationally with the evidence of his father's role in plural marriage. Even though he was the president of the church for almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. Yet a careful examination of extant historical evidence clearly demonstrates that Joseph Smith III 
pursued this course purposefully, methodically, and meticulously in an effort to exonerate his deceased father and clear the family name and to distinguish his fledging church from the Utah Mormons. Richard Bushman has noted the phenomenon described as a culture of honor, which was extremely influ influential among certain populations in the 19th century. He asserted that the culture of honor bred deep loyalties to friends and family, while instilling a fierce urge to avenge insults. The greatest fear in life, a fear stronger than death or damnation, was public humiliation. Newell Avery, Lanius, and others have also inferred that Joseph Smith III's irrational treatment of the evidence of his father's involvement in the inception and practice of plural marriage was likely a result of the influence of this culture of honor. However, Joseph Smith III's attempted cover-up was a messy one. On multiple fronts, it eventually led to the disillusionment of his brother David, David Hiram, who became convinced of the family deception during his RLDS mission to Utah, and, and it exasperated conflicts among leaders and friends in and out of the RLDS church who knew otherwise. Perhaps subsidiary only to the need for increased membership, Joseph Smith III's desire to exonerate his father and clear his family name became a primary motivation for the Josephite mission to rescue the deceived and oppressed Brighamite Utah Mormons from the perceived captive grip of, de of a desp despotic and perverse hierarchy. Ironically, in his attempt to clear the family name, Joseph Smith III and his brother's mission to Utah only led to further abuse of that name. <clears throat> Not only were their interactions with Brigham Young extremely polemic, they incited Brigham's repeated public defaming of their mother. Brigham overtly accused Emma Smith of lying to her children, undermining their spiritual potential, and even initiating what he perceived to be their demonic missions to Utah. Regardless, it is obvious that one of the primary factors leading to the emergence and growth of the RLDS movement in the latter half of the 19th century was the adherents' belief and assertion that, as Launius put it, Joseph Smith was a good man, and good men don't practice plural marriage, and therefore Joseph Smith could not have originated or participated in the practice. <laughs> Wow. <clears throat> in other words, in an effort to vindicate both Joseph Smith and his family, the rejection of this practice and any association with its origins became a, if not the primary tenet of that movement, successfully distinguishing it from the Utah Church. The created the created an opening for members of our church who might have been disenchanted with plural marriage. Brigham Young, or both... I apologize, this, I should say, this created an opening. Immigrants arriving to Utah from Europe during the last half of the 19th century experienced a serious or somewhat unanticipated cultural shock on multiple levels. Although the practice of plural marriage had been publicly announced in Utah in 1852, many of those arriving from Europe had only been exposed to the first principles of the gospel and were disturbed to discover that certain Latter-day Saints were involved in the principle. In addition, the prevailing economic conditions of the time required many to abandon obsolete or unsuitable trades in favor of farming in an arid climate at a remote location assigned by the Utah church leaders. As a result of these and other challenges, some of these British converts found refuge in the message of the RLDS missionary sent to Utah by Joseph Smith III, the leader of the RLDS church, or as it was known at that time period, the Josephites. 
The Josephite missionary's message was impassioned and succinct. Joseph Smith III was the true successor to his father. Joseph Smith Jr., Brigham Young, was a usurper who ruled as a dictator without legal or spiritual authority, and plural marriage was a damnable heresy concocted by Brigham Young and not Joseph Smith. The Josephite missionaries to Utah labored tirelessly in an effort to attract converts and establish lasting congregations throughout the remainder of the 19th century. Despite this, historians generally concur with our LDS historian Roger Launius' assessment of the improvident Josephite mission to Utah. Young's followers, for the most part, accepted his leadership without misgivings, and the Josephite missionaries found that it was difficult to break the chains of bondage when those chains of bondage did not exist. In fact, Susan Easton Black has shown that the combined efforts of these Josephite missionaries from 1863 to 1889 only drew 1,557 Josephite converts away from the Brighamite movement. That's over a 20-year period. In 2007, representatives from the Brigham Young Family Association and the Joseph Smith Sr. and Emma Hale Smith Historical Society met at the Nauvoo House. I was invited to attend this meeting, although I could not attend. I was invited to attend. There, a healing letter, as it was called, was read as a bridge to connect the two families. It was an apology from the BYFA to the Smith family organizations. So we have the Brigham Young family apologizing to the Smith family, even though the Brigham family didn't do anything wrong. With the Cohen bill under review in the Senate, the eyes of the nation's lawmakers were on the Saints. The Saints believed that critics in Salt Lake City were trying to turn public opinion against the church. So church leaders counseled the men of the school to be patient and wise and not to give offense. They also warned them not to look to wicked men to lead the saints. After organizing their Church of Zion, William and Elias had spoken of a coming man who would lead their new movement. William had reached out to Joseph Smith III, perhaps to recruit his leadership but Joseph had not joined their cause. That spring, however, Amasa Lyman announced his decision to join the Church of Zion, immediately sparking rumors that he would lead it. Amasa had been released from the Quorum of the Twelve in 1867 for apostasy, and few people were surprised when he embraced the new movement. Brigham encouraged members of the School of the Prophets to leave such dissenters alone and refrain from criticizing them. In the meantime, he vowed to continue building up God's kingdom. I intend to use my influence to strengthen Israel and tell Jesus reigns whose right it is to reign, he declared. Over the last year, Amasa Lyman had been preaching for the Church of Zion and attending seances at which spiritualist mediums claimed to speak for Joseph and Hiram Smith, Chief Walkara, and other saints who had died. People reported hearing rapping noises or seeing a table levitate during the meetings. While these seances drew some saints to the new movement, most were wary of them, and the Church of Zion soon floundered. By the time Brigham returned to Salt Lake City in February 1871, the new movement was less a religious organization than, than it was a group of people with a shared goal of ending the church's influence in the area. In April, the leaders of the new movement changed the name of the newspaper from the Mormon Tribune to the Salt Lake Tribune. Then in July, they dedicated the Liberal Institute, a spacious meeting house in which they could deliver sermons, hold seances, and stage lectures and liberal party political meetings. The new movement had also succeeded 
in drawing away Brigham's former friends, TBH and Fanny Stenhouse, who had been on the cusp of leaving the church for several months. Charges came on October 2nd when a United States Marshal arrested Brigham for living with more than one woman as his wife. Daniel Wells and George Q. Cannon were arrested on similar charges. Outside the territory, newspapers predicted that civil war would break out in Salt Lake City and reported that the Saints had stockpiled guns and positioned a cannon on the foothills of the mountains. Oh, boy. In reality, church leaders cooperated with the lawmen, and lawyers began preparing for Brigham to answer the charges in court the following week. When that day came, the courtroom was crowded. Brigham arrived 15 minutes before the judge and sat patiently, his coolness disarming his critics. After Judge McKean arrived, Brigham's lawyers tried to stop the hearing claiming that officials had not followed proper procedure when they assembled a grand jury with no church members. When McKean denied this request, the lawyers tried to find fault with the charges themselves, hoping to have them dropped altogether. Once again, the judge denied the request. During the hearing, McKean revealed that he saw the case not as a trial of Brigham's innocence or guilt, but as a crucial battle in a war between the saints' revelations and federal law. While the case at bar is called The People versus Brigham Young, he stated, its other and real title is Federal Authority versus Polygamic Theocracy. Well, the case at bar is called the people. Was nice. well, the, yeah, while the case at bar is called the people versus Brigham Young, he stated, its other real title is federal authority versus polygamic theocracy. He was not interested in being an impartial judge. In his eyes, the prophet was already guilty. Meanwhile, Brigham consulted with his lawyers and advisors about the course he should take. He knew that he would be arrested and he was now more concerned about his safety than before. He wanted assurances that he would not be killed while in custody. For a time, he considered going into hiding, as Joseph Smith had done in Nauvoo. Murder was a capital offense, and if a biased jury found him guilty, he could be executed. But in mid-December, his lawyers urged him to return to the city, confident that he would be safe. One night, Brigham dreamed that two men were trying to take control of a large meeting of saints. After he awoke, he knew what he needed to do. I feel like going home and running the meeting with the help of God and my brethren, he told his friends. A United States Marshal arrested the prophet one week later and escorted him to Judge McKean's courtroom. Brigham remained calm and confident throughout the proceedings. Noting his old age and ill health, the prophet's lawyers asked the judge to release him on bail. McKean denied the request and placed Brigham under house arrest. The trial was scheduled to begin a short time later, and the Salt Lake Tribune predicted that every newspaper in the United States and Great Britain would publish its proceedings. The great trial was postponed, however, and days soon stretched into weeks. The case eventually ended up at the Supreme Court, who finally decided the case in April. Though some of his associates were confident that the court would rule in their favor, McKean looked anxious as the presiding judge read the court's decision. Upon the whole, the presiding judge declared, we are of the opinion that the jury in this case was not selected and summoned in conformity with law. Judge McKean left the room cursing the ruling and insisting 
that he had done nothing wrong. All criminal charges issued by illegally formed grand juries in the territory had been arrested. Brigham Young was free. In December 1873, after years of lobbying for the church in Utah and Washington, D.C., George Q. Cannon was sworn in as the territory's delegate to the United States House of Representatives. In the early 1870s, public opinion of the church was as low as ever in the United States. President Ulysses Grant was determined to end plural marriage in Utah, having already promised to stop efforts to bestow Utah statehood until that happened. In the spring of 1874, Senator Luke Poland presented another bill designed to strengthen the Moral Anti-Bigamy Act by seizing greater control over Utah's courts. Fanny and T.B.H. Stenhouse, meanwhile, continued to write critically about the church and speak against plural marriage to audiences across the country. Likewise, Anne Eliza Young, an estranged plural wife of Brigham Young, who had sued him for divorce, had begun giving public speeches denouncing the church. So as you can see, you know the church today is nothing you know the church back then. Back then they were constantly fighting the courts and their public opinion, and that is really a pretty peaceful place. That summer and fall, William Carey, the United States Attorney in Utah, took steps to begin prosecuting well-known saints who practiced plural marriage. Facing the prospect of more arrest among the saints, church leaders decided to set up a test court case to challenge the legality of the moral anti-polygamy law. Striking a deal with Carey, they agreed to let him convict one man for polygamy so that church lawyers could appeal the case before a higher court. In exchange, the federal attorney promised that he would not prosecute anyone else until the appeal process on the test case concluded. In making this deal, church leaders hoped for the higher court would decide that the anti-polygamy law violated the saints' religious rights and would overturn the conviction. That summer, Martin Harris came to Utah on the Transcontinental Railroad. After learning of Martin's desire to come west, Brigham Young had been eager to assist one who had given so much time and money to the church in the past. He asked Edward Stevenson, a seasoned missionary, to collect donations for Martin and then help the old man make the long journey from Kirtland. Send for him, Brigham had instructed, even if it were to take the last dollar of my own. Which, of course, it didn't. Martin's arrival caused a stir in Salt Lake City, though he was not the first former church member to come to the territory. Thomas Marsh, the original president of the Quorum of the Twelve, had been rebaptized and come west 13 years earlier, his heart full of regret for leaving the church in 1838. Martin's status as a Book of Mormon witness set, an, set him apart, however. At 87 years old, he was one of the last living participants in some of the earliest miracles of the new dispensation. In the weeks that followed, Martin reunited with his wife, children, and other family members in the territory. His older brother, Emer, had died the previous year in northern Utah's Cache Valley. But their widowed sister, Naomi, Naomi Bant, lived in Utah Valley. On September 17th, she went with Martin to the endowment house, where Edward Stevenson rebaptized him, after which Orson Pratt, John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, and Joseph F. Smith reconfirmed him a member of the church. Martin and Naomi were then baptized and confirmed for several of their ancestors. During the later years of his life, Brigham Young spent much time and energy organizing the auxiliaries of the church that would bless the saints for the next decade. Despite his misgivings, he reorganized the Relief Society, calling Eliza R. Snow as the president, authorizing her and her counselors to organize this society in each ward and branch of the church. 
They traveled over the entire territory doing such. Development of the Auxiliaries The sisters met semi-monthly. One meeting each month was devoted to sewing and caring for the needs of the poor. The second meeting featured discussions on elevating educational and spiritual themes and the bearing of testimonies. <clears throat> the Relief Society was given several special missions by the Prophet. The development of sericulture, the production of silk. They were to produce enough silk for all the temples, their temple clothing, and other needs. The storing of wheat and other foodstuffs against a time of need. The study of hygiene and nursing. The Women's Exponent, a semi-monthly newspaper, was published and aided in uniting the sisters throughout the territory. Brigham Young organized the first stake Relief Society in Ogden. The Relief Society met in private homes and also constructed their own halls. The idea for a Sunday school was a carryover from many of those converted from Protestant religions. In 1849, Richard Valentine, with the permission of his bishop, organized the first Sunday school in Salt Lake Valley. Sunday schools were set up in other wards, but with the advance of Johnston's army and the move south in 1857, the Sunday school was abandoned. In 1864, when Elder George Q. Cannon returned from serving as the British Mission President, he saw a need for teaching the youth of the church the gospel. He reorganized the Sunday schools, and in 1866, he published the bimonthly juvenile instructor for the youth who were members of the Sunday school. In 1867, the first permanent Sunday school organization was established, and in 1872, it was named the Deseret Sunday School Union. It quickly spread throughout the territory. There were no classes for adults. The first organization for the young women was called the Retrenchment Society. Girls pledged to retrench or cut back on all excess or extravagant practices. By 1870, the society was operating in all the Salt Lake wards, and Eliza R. Snow began to take it throughout the territory. After the Young Men's Mutual Improvement Association was organized, the name was changed to Match, Young Women's Mutual Improvement Association, 1878. Brigham Young expressed a desire in 1875 that a unified organization for young men be established in the church. The prophet wanted the boys to develop intellectually and spiritually and to have needed recreation under proper supervision. Accordingly, he called 21-year-old Junius F. Wells, son of his counselor Daniel H. Wells, to establish Young Men's Mutual Improvement Associations, first in Salt Lake City and then throughout the territory. The association began its own periodical, The Contributor, in 1879. As the name suggests, several articles in each issue came from the young men themselves. The conflict between Gentiles and saints over school curriculum led to an education crisis in Utah. The brethren decided to rejuvenate the University of Deseret so they could continue religious education. Salt Lake City Mayor Abraham O. Smoot was asked to move to Provo to head the Utah County branch of UOD, present day University of Utah. When it failed financially, he established Brigham Young Academy in its place. To ensure that there would be religious instruction at the school, Brigham Young specifically stipulated that the Old and New Testaments, the Book of Mormon, and the Book of Doctrine and Covenants shall be read and their doctrines inculcated in the academy. In 1876, skilled German educator Carl G. Mazur took over the principalship of the Brigham Young Academy and began a stellar career in church education, which later included serving 
as superintendent of church schools. By the 20th century, this small institution had grown to become Brigham Young University. In 1877, a second academy, Brigham Young College, was opened in Logan and continued until 1926. The buildings of the college were then turned over to the city of Logan. This is present-day Utah State. Plans also went forward to establish a third academy called Salt Lake State Academy in Salt Lake City. This academy did not begin actual operations until 1886. It went by several names and eventually came to be known as Latter-day Saints College. The college officially closed in 1931 during the Depression. Faculty members then organized a business college on their own, which was later acquired by the church and named LDS Business College. Although today is named Ensign College. As saints continued to come to Utah, the need to establish new settlements grew. Although difficult because of the crossing of the Colorado River and the aridness of the land, Brigham Young was determined to colonize Arizona and Mexico. This map shows some of the early settlements there. Mesa, Snowflake, and Juarez are some of the results of this effort that still exists today. Brigham Young announced the building of three temples. Number one, St. George, announced November 9, 1871, dedicated April 6, 1877. Two, Manti, announced June 25, 1875, and dedicated on May 17, 1888. Three, Logan, announced October 6, 1876, and dedicated May 17, 1884. President Brigham Young had identified the site of the Salt Lake Temple in 1847, shortly after arriving in the valley. Under his direction, the cornerstones of the temple were laid on April 6, 1853. That same day, during General Conference, President Young stated, Five years ago, last July, I was here and saw in the spirit the temple not ten feet from where we have laid the chief cornerstone. I have not inquired what kind of a temple we should build. Why? Because it was represented before me. I have never looked upon that ground, but the vision of it was there. I see it as plainly as if it was in reality before me. Prior to the completion of the temple, President Young realized the need for a structure that could hold a significant number of saints at one time. A pattern for a large, dome-shaped house of worship was vivid in his mind. In the spring of 1863, construction began on the tabernacle. By the fall of 1867, the tabernacle and its organ were used at the October Conference. With an understanding of the Lord's plan for the structuring and layout of Independence, Missouri, Brigham felt impressed to organize Salt Lake City in the same fashion. Also, with a prophetic vision of the expansion of the church throughout the West, he directed the colonization of settlements across the territory of Utah, southward into Mexico, and northward into Canada. The St. George Temple was also constructed under his direction and was dedicated in early April of 1877. In August of that same year, President Brigham Young the master builder, passed away in Salt Lake City. In January 1871, Brigham Young attended a council of local church leaders in the home of Arasta Snow, who presided over the church in the region. As the meeting was drawing to a close, Brigham asked the men what they thought about building the temple in St. George. Excitement filled the room. Glory! Hallelujah! Erastus exclaimed. Before finishes his San Pete tour in 1875, Brigham spoke with local church leaders. We can build temples here cheaper than the one at Salt Lake, he told them. You feel like taking hold and building a temple here yourselves? Each man in the room raised his hand to show his support, 
and they agreed that the prophet should select the site. Brigham had visited several possible locations, and he announced his decision the next day. I would say my spirit rests entirely upon the spur of the mountain, pointing into Manti, he said. Although work on the Salt Lake Temple progressed, the, Th the St. George Temple was the first completed, 1871 through 1877. Brigham Young inaugurated the first endowment work for the dead there, or here. Wilford Woodruff was called as a temple president and began work for the dead in earnest. It is here that the work for the Founding Fathers was completed. This is a picture of the quarry where they take the rock from the St. George Temple. Considered his last major contribution to the Church, Brigham Young reorganized the Quorum of the Twelve basing seniority on years of continuous service, placing John Taylor ahead of Wilford Woodruff and both of those ahead of Orson Hyde and Orson Pratt, released all members of the Quorum of the Twelve who were serving as stake presidents, and made all stakes equal, and stakes were also expanded from 13 to 20 and given local autonomy. Bishoprics were to consist of three high priests given local autonomy and their need to preside over temple concerns and Aaronic priesthood re-emphasized. More young men were ordained to Aaronic priesthood. Brigham Young served longer as the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints than any, that has any other president of the church. His contributions were numerous and many faceted. So much of what is cherished, revered, or even taken for granted in the church today has roots in the contributions and leadership of President Young. One of Brigham Young's greatest legacies was his leadership in keeping the church relatively self-sufficient from the Gentile world in recreation, business, government, and education. Historians recognize the massive kingdom of the saints built up in the Rocky Mountains as a tribute to this man. This was achieved against great odds, the interference of federal troops and government officers, a desert climate and rough terrain, outside businessmen, the fashions of Babylon, the coming of the Transcontinental Railroad, and the discovery of precious metals in Utah. Brigham Young led his people in one cooperative venture after another. As a leading member of the Twelve in 1838 through 1839, he organized the persecuted saints in their exodus from Missouri and in their establishment of a refuge in Illinois. Later, Brigham led the saints from Nauvoo across the Iowa plains to the winter quarters and on to the Great Salt Lake. Then, directing his attention to the tens of thousands of new converts in Britain and Europe, he founded the Perpetual Immigrating Fund Company, which established the best system of regulated immigration in American history. He organized colonization parties to lay out agricultural villages in some 350 locations in Utah and in parts of Idaho, Wyoming, Nevada, Arizona, and Colorado. He has been the brain, the eye, the ear, the mouth and hand for the entire people of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. From the greatest problems connected with the organization of this church, down to the smallest minutia connected with the work, he has left upon it the impress of his great mind. From the organization of the church and the construction of temples, the building of tabernacles, from the creation of a provisional state government and a territorial government, down to the small matter of directing the shape of these seats upon which we sit this day, upon all these things, as well as upon all the settlements of the territory, the impress of his genius is apparent. Nothing was too small for his mind. Nothing was too large. 
Well, as we come to the end of the Brigham Young year, I just want to bring it just when the Brigham Young was a prophet of God. It's hard to see that he wasn't. Remember, he started off in the very small beginnings in the in the state of uh, Iowa, and later became the great prophet of the Restoration. And this is a very testament in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen.